Today we're talking about A Beautiful Planet, the newest IMAX film made in conjunction with NASA that is narrated by Oscar winner Jennifer Lawrence. We've got the acclaimed director here, Tony Myers, who is also the filmmaker behind uh, Blue Planet, Hubble 3D, and Space Station 3D, presented by IMAX. Thank you for joining us, Tony. My pleasure. Great to be here. So I've actually gotten the pleasure of watching A Beautiful Planet. It is stunning. I think the IMAX screens really serve the film's purpose as well, looking at the vistas of space, looking at the Earth itself. But it actually isn't just about the Earth. It's about man's connection with the Earth, which seems inextricable the way it's presented. Uh, it does something interesting with a dual presentation of the Earth and man's connection, but also following the daily lives of ISS astronauts. Uh, what made you want to explore this narrative in particular? Well, I thought, especially for young people, uh, but for our whole audience, that um, the analogy between the Earth and the space station both are closed life support systems. Mm -hmm. um, the only difference between them is uh, that the space station gets resupply ships of of food and oxygen and and various things as it, 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 it it's required to keep the crew alive the earth on the other hand does not get resupply ships uh, so I thought that comparison uh, would uh, bring home the fact that we really need to take care of our pl beautiful planet and make sure that its resources are maintained and sustained yeah, I had heard the term uh, spaceship Earth many times before, but I never really understood the depth of it until I watched this film and thought, oh, yes, we're, we're kind of on borrowed time ourselves here, or at least the way, rate that we're going. Uh, we did get to see the daily lives of these astronauts. There were three expedition uh, periods, uh, 42, 43, and 44. Um, and we did get to see some quirkier moments for them. For instance, Samantha uh, uh trying out space espresso, getting her hair cut. Uh, we had astronauts trying out lettuce grown from the veggie system. Were there any other moments that you wished you could have put in the film that were ultimately left out? Oh, there were, well, well, well there was a lot of actual science that we had mm -hmm. that we just could not put in, unfortunately. Um, but uh, no, I think I put most of the quirky moments in. Um, I think that the audience always appreciates the human side of uh, people and doesn't want just to know that uh, astronauts are the superheroes they are. So we try to work the, the uh, humorous moments in as much as we can. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of stuff that we couldn't work into the film because we have a short timeline and, and uh, we have to squeeze it all into uh, under an hour. I did like seeing their uh, perspective of the Earth, and we get to literally see their perspective of the Earth from the ISS. And from there, there were some uh, unique ways of viewing the Earth from there. For instance, we were looking at the lack of borders, or certain places on the Earth where it's clearly apparent there are borders. And then we get to see cities glowing at night, like molten gold and fishing boats uh, green in the ocean. It was really beautiful, and I think it painted the difference, or the similarities, rather, of humanity and Earth being inextricably tied together. Uh, this was an interesting, mm, uh, well, this was a new moment for, because I, I, I read this was the first time digital IMAX use, uh, cameras were used to film in space, and they were unmodified commercial cameras. What were the difficulties or uh, well, new challenges? It, it, what you say was actually, it was a first time for me, too, and all of our team to uh, see those beautiful views of the cities at night and lightning and stars in the night sky and aurora. All those things uh, were not able to be captured previously by IMAX 65 millimeter negative because the film speed is too slow. Mm -hmm. And we were we had to fly the digital cameras because with the retirement of the space shuttle, there is no longer the up mass to and and down mass to get uh, film and cameras back and forth to space in a timely fa uh, fashion. Mm -hmm. So we had to go digital, and I'm so glad we did because it opened up and revealed a whole new magical world, which is the the Earth at night to us. Yes, you do have a very unique uh, position directing these films that are in space, hundreds of miles above the Earth. Uh, what challenges, unique ones, do you face? Well, 
we train the astronaut crews ahead of time uh, for about 20 hours uh, each. Um, uh, we have a wonderful trainer, James Nyhouse, who's uh, uh, also our director of photography. And he trains the crews how to operate the cameras. And I train them more about making a film and how the storyline will work and uh, how to shoot interesting scenes. And uh, they learn basically in that training everything they need to know to be filmmakers on orbit. Mm -hmm. So I don't, because they're the greatest learners in the world and very, very smart, I don't have to worry because I know they're going to get up there and do an absolutely great job. And they're all very creative people with uh, lots of ideas of their own. So uh, I, I, I don't worry about it very much. Well, I mean, they are very smart, but they have to be mindful of a lot of things going on. Uh, just living daily life, as we saw in the film, it looked like organized chaos would be a great way, or fairly just, yeah, yes, pretty he, organized. Butch called it organized bedlam, which bedlam. I like. That was when, when, when they receive, they unload a, mm -hmm. uh, um, a resupply ship. Uh, it's true, there's a lot of stuff on station and they have to be very, very careful of how they, they, they stow it uh, to find it again. But um, the, the, the one thing that we can't do is interfere with their daily lives in terms of their main occupations when they're up there, which is to perform science, to look after the station, do station maintenance, which sometimes involves spacewalks. Those are things that we can't, making a film, interfere with. So they did all of this on their spare time, at nights and weekends, et cetera, et cetera. So it just goes to show you what a labor of love it was. Yes. Um, we also, this was a, a lot of firsts in this film. And another one was, this is the first appearance from a, a NASA and IMAX conjunction film uh, where we see SpaceX Dragon ships. What do you think the, the growing role will be of commercial space flight? Well, I think it's a wonderful partnership. And I think that, uh, you know, perhaps down the line in the future, sp space travel will be commercial just the way aviation went that route eventually. I mean, it, it, the, the, uh, uh, in dividing into all the different airlines in the world. And I think that uh, future space travel will need that commercial participation simply because it's a, an international participation as exists now and even expanding because it's far too expensive for any one government to undertake anymore. To get to another planet is just massively uh, expensive. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things I liked most about the movie was that along with these beautiful vistas of Earth, of our galaxy, of beyond our galaxy, uh, there were some stark truths, which was we saw rainforests uh, burning, we saw glaciers melting, breaking off into the, the ocean. Uh, climate change is shown to be definitively happening, and the film doesn't seem to mind that, uh, you know, right here on, on Earth there is a reality of people denying climate change. The film presents it as this is what's happening. Um, and I really, I really appreciated that point of view. What went into crafting that presentation? Well, when thinking about making the film initially, um, you know, I did not wish to berate the audience for mm -hmm. uh, being bad people and doing terrible things to the earth and causing all these problems even though it is human beings who are causing these problems, right. especially with the burning of fossil fuels and, and the pollution that ensues and the, and the uh, rising temperatures. Um, but I really wanted to uh, present the pr dual perspective so that you saw these things, but at the same time you saw what a beautiful, unique planet we live on, how fragile it is, and how much it is worth saving and taking care of. And I thought if I can inspire young people uh, to take better care of it and look for solutions above and beyond all, that's the thing, to look for solutions and work together to try and solve some of the challenges we're facing, that would be a really good thing. I did appreciate that, which is we need to appreciate how, what a wonderful and unique situation this is, which we did see through some visualizations. Um, and speaking on those visualizations, they weren't CGI crafted. They were based on actual data. Is that correct? 
That's correct. We did uh, we did a couple of visualizations which are which are really unique, and those are the flight into the Milky Way to find our Earth on the far side of it, and um, uh, find our Sun and then our Earth, um, and then at the end we leave our Earth and go back out into the Milky Way into a, a region that has been studied by the Kepler satellite. Um, uh, to find a Goldilocks zone, meaning uh, an area where exoplanets have been found. Mm -hmm. uh, and both those sequences were based and made with real star data. They are not just pinpoints put in by a CGI program mm -hmm. of any sort. They, they, you are actually flying through the real star catalogs and star data. So it is all accurate. The only thing in the Goldilocks, Kepler itself has found many, many, up to 4,000 planets around other stars. And this is a real system that it's found. The only thing that it can't see is the actual texture on 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 the globes of the planets mm -hmm. um it has sensors that tell tell it whether um if there's an atmosphere present whether it's a gas giant or a terrestrial uh rocky planet uh they have tell that through sensors not not through a visual camera so that's the only thing that we added there was the textures on the planets um, and then we have another sequence, which is turning the Earth into Mars by ah, taking yes. away its water. That was one of my favorite ones, actually, uh, where we got to see it was the camera was going along the, the water, and we see the water dry up, the vegetation go away, and then when we reach the top of the, the hill or the coastline, we see what looks like the appearance of Mars in its current climate. And that is really Mars. That is the Gale Crater that we fly over uh, and, and land, land on. And when it talks about standing on Mars and finding a cold and desolate place, that is a real view, absolutely. Um, uh, that, that sequence was done by, um, uh, suggested through the Jet Propulsion Lab, with whom I've worked on many other films. And it was done by a, a company called Bohemian Grey, and I think they did an absolutely incredible job. But one thing of interest is that, that the beginning of that shot, where you're flying over the water, was actually shot on IMAX film uh, 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. for, for the first ever all IMAX film, and I thought it'd be great to use that. Wow. Well, uh, this... This film does a great job of presenting uh, the Earth as it is, how lucky we are to live in such a zone, uh, astronomically speaking, and it shows different realities about what the Earth is going through now. Uh, what do you hope people are talking about or doing in the future to help preserve our beautiful planet? Well, I think, I think as I've said often in, in introducing the film as it opens, is that our job, uh, you know, even if we're not all brilliant scientists, is to get the word out for sure um, that uh, we need to take better care of our planet and how to do that. And of course, that starts in school programs and uh, with with young kids. And then if we can get those kids uh, into universities and, and taking uh, science uh, degrees and, and becoming botanists and zoologists and uh, so many fields apply to this, uh, yes. as I've often said, if if one of them comes up with a with a solution to building a fusion reactor, that would solve a lot of our problems on mm -hmm. Earth. So that's what I'm looking to do with the film, and uh, I think the crews that shot it would agree with me. It does seem like a lofty goal. I hope we get there one day, but of course we have to start now. We have to start talking and acting and doing to get there. I think as human beings, we often forget how great and, and I mean that in terms of mass, but also in terms of uh, how wonderful and majestic the Earth is and how, how lucky we are to have this and that we do need to preserve this. And I think that your film does a really great job of visualizing this, of making it a very apparent and clear to anyone watching. And we're certainly getting the conversation started with that. Um, a Beautiful Planet opens April 29th in IMAX and IMAX 3D. Thank you so much for talking to us, Tony. I really appreciate your perspective. It was my pleasure to talk to you, and I hope uh, lots of people uh, get to see the film and enjoy the Earth as we enjoyed looking at it, too. Well, I highly recommend it, everyone. Thanks so much. You're very, very welcome. Bye-bye now.